Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMagan with the Mises Institute, and with me is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And uh, this is uh, the week of the month where we do foreign policy. So we have back Zachary Yost. Now, Zachary's been with us for a while. I often bring him in for foreign policy topics. He's been with a variety of related organizations, such as the John Quincy Adams Society. And he is now a freelance writer working on a variety of foreign policy topics. And this time we're going to look at a recent issue that uh, popped up on Law and Liberty, where Zachary wrote an article refuting some claims by some Polish nationals, uh, some uh, literal employees of the Polish state who are here in the U.S. lobbying for the U.S. to become more involved in Eastern Europe, for the U.S. to spend more dollars, maybe even expend American blood in Eastern Europe, and that somehow the Americans owe it to the Eastern Europeans to be more involved there. And so we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, historical context around there and the implications of that today. But first, before we go into that, I just want to make sure and mention our upcoming conference. We've got one coming up uh, on November 9th, just in a few weeks. That's in Fort Myers, Florida. It's called Elections and the Economy. Do they really matter? And we'll have some of our uh, top speakers there. So if uh, you are anywhere near Fort Myers, you should definitely consider signing up for that. You can go to Mises.org uh, to our events page. That's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G slash events. And Ryan, we just got through with a great event up in Hilton Head, South Carolina, our Supporters Summit. And the highlight of the event, along with meeting a lot of our great donors there, was the uh, world debut of our documentary, Playing With Fire, Money, Banking, and the Federal Reserve, narrated by Ryan McMakin. So if you enjoy his voice on here, you'll enjoy it even more during that documentary. Had a a great screening there at a movie theater near the, the resort. It was great. Uh, we're working on views right now. So you can find that uh, documentary at Mises.org slash fire. Fire as in the, the way that the Fed plays both uh, claims to be the firefighter, but is really the arsonist of the economy. And also relative to this topic, if you're interested in more on these sort of revisionist historical topics, a reminder, we're going to have a History of War Revisionism Conference coming up next year at Auburn, Alabama. So if you like this topic, check out that conference as well. And I'll be there also talking about Ralph Rako's uh, work in revisionist history. And we'll, we'll actually be talking about that a lot more as uh, we get closer to May. But uh, And this, of course, I'll be mentioning him a couple of times during this discussion as we talk about what's the deal with the U.S.'s role in uh, the Soviet Union's uh, really hegemony uh, at, at various times in Eastern Europe. And then their, their claimed ongoing hegemony in the region uh, among some anti-Russian activists. And... Uh, Zachary, I was just looking at your article on this in Law and Liberty called Europe's Interests and Ours the States from October 8th, and you can certainly find it there. And the you really, you're responding to an article by uh, a couple of Polish activists uh, you know, who basically work for the Polish regime or are in Poland. Uh, I wasn't quite clear on what their story was there. But these are hardly like uh, just local farm boys who are deeply concerned about uh, the Poles. And as so often happens, we get these people who are from foreign countries and they come to the United States and they start lobbying the U.S. government and they start lecturing Americans on how Americans should be willing to spend more money or maybe die in Eastern Europe in order to fight the various enemies that Eastern Europeans have. And so let's just talk about that a little bit and also just the these historical issues surrounding the U.S.'s involvement in Eastern Europe and uh, the situation since World War II and how this just continues to keep coming back and being an issue um, and how maybe, maybe just the U.S. shouldn't have been such an enthusiastic supporter of Stalin in World War II. Or maybe it wouldn't have mattered. I, I don't know. I think there's some unanswered questions here, but let's just start speculating about some of them and and just uh, throwing out some of the facts. So why don't you just go ahead and introduce your article here, and uh, that'll get the ball rolling. Right, yeah. So I'm responding to this essay that came out, uh, <laughs> that Yalta's Spectre, 
which is about, I mean, it's about the war in Ukraine and America's role in it, and it's drawing on the history of World War II to basically say Russia can't be trusted and America shouldn't decide anything without the agreement of all the Eastern Europeans. And uh, it, it advances some rather, in my view, insane, crazy, <laughs> uh, deranged even claims. Uh, basically, they argue that uh, uh, the Yalta Conference is where basically the UK and the United States signed off on the Soviet Union occupying half of Europe. And the authors seem to think that it mattered <laughs> whether or not the U.S. and the U.K. agreed to that or not. There were, you know, hundreds of Soviet divisions in Europe. Uh, the uh, idea that the West would have won the war or at least won it without, I mean, massive, enormous losses beyond really our comprehension of any war we've the United States, at least, has participated in is laughable. And they, they more or less seem to be strongly, I mean, the, we could not have just said, no, Stalin, get out. We would have had to evict him from Eastern Europe. So that would have meant continuing World War II uh, by attacking the Soviet Union. Which would, which uh, by the way, the Nazi leadership after uh, Hitler killed himself was in favor of that. They tried to selectively say, "We're going to surrender to the West, but the war will continue in the East, and you can join us." Uh, I mean, the war on the Eastern Front really was World War II. Uh, all the other fronts in Europe and North Africa were sideshows on just the basis of resources consumed and lives lost. The majority of German casualties were on the Eastern Front. Russia itself sustained 27 million casualties in their, you know, just giant slog to uh, Germany. So uh, they're, they're, it's, it's just nuts, basically, the history they're painting to then say, oh, the U.S. can't trust Russia we can't let them have a foothold in Europe, which is something we can address later. They're, they say they say twice at least that Russia's not part of Europe, <laughs> which is a, a, another story in of itself. But um, we can't trust Russia. You can't make an agreement with it. And their history of the Ukraine conflict is also flawed. They said that uh, Russia only participated in the two Minsk Accords because they uh, wanted to build their strength up to invade Ukraine. This is laughable. This is insane because we know uh, Angela Merkel is on the record herself saying that that was Germany's position uh, on the Minsk Accords, was to just string Russia along, no intention of uh, 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 fulfilling, basically making the accords work so that Ukraine could build its strength. And this is, uh, they, so they're saying, oh, Russia can't be trusted. Which, sure, no one can be trusted in international politics. The lack of uh, being able to trust uh, for, uh, because of a lack of knowledge is the you know, essential aspect of the tragedy of great power politics. Uh, so basically this piece it was just garbage and I just pointed out that none of this history makes sense. And, uh, and also we needed the Soviet Union to end the war in Japan. It was not our nukes that did that. It was the Soviet uh, invasion of Manchuria and Karafuto. They were about to invade Hokkaido, and Japan realized they didn't want to end up like Eastern Europe, carved up and occupied uh, by the Soviet Union. That is the main impetus, I would argue, for their surrender. So basically this argument is, is nonsense. <laughs> and we can delve into the details because there's more, much more wrong with it, too. <laughs> well, and I should note that at least among older conservatives, this sort of stuff resonates a lot because, uh, well, this sort of stuff, by which I mean specifically this, this claim that uh, the West had somehow betrayed Poland at the end of the war by not telling Stalin to get lost and that this had been an affirmative act 
uh, on the part of Roosevelt, who, by the way, I am no, I am not defending by any means. Uh, in fact, <laughs> there was there's a great line by uh, one of uh, um, one of Roosevelt's detractors who, uh, t toward the end, like in the 1950s, had had commented about Roosevelt that uh, Roosevelt had said that he had not given uh, he had not handed anything over to Stalin at Yalta. And, uh, and that uh, Roosevelt had said this toward the end of his life. And so Roosevelt died as he had lived with a lie upon his lips. <laughs> and uh, that's one of, my, one of my favorite quotes about uh, Roosevelt, I think. However, you are correct, right? There were, there were just Soviet troops everywhere throughout Eastern Europe, and they had done a lot of the heavy fighting. Uh, this is something that Reiko likes to point out, is that by the time the US landed on, uh, with D-Day in Northern France, that the soldiers that were fighting the Americans in the West, Americans and the British, uh, they were uh, they were old men, young boys, uh, the less experienced soldiers, because the the Nazi regime had had to send to the Eastern Front all of its best fighters to fight against the Soviets who were gaining ground quickly in Eastern Germany at that point. And, the, and that, of course, helped the Americans immensely in terms of lowering uh, casualties. And as you noted, right, just the battle casualties for the Soviets, not counting all the starved civilians, which, as you noted, amounted to like 25 million, 26 million, something like that. It was eight or nine million just Soviet soldiers in that war, well, compared to about 350,000 Americans. And so you can just imagine, right, how, how Americans would feel about uh, that sort of death and destruction for Americans had that been inflicted upon us during that war. So you don't have to call the Soviets the good guys in that case, but just acknowledge the reality of the fact that they were drawing a lot of the, the, the Germans' best fighting power during that period and in many ways uh, making it easier upon us. But uh, ideologically also, there was a very popular book among some older conservatives who, who, and this helped perpetuate the idea that the U.S. should have just, all they had to do was say at Yalta that the Soviets had to move out uh, and it would have been easy and fine. There was a book that came out called I Saw Poland Betrayed. <laughs> An American Ambassador Reports to the American People was the subtitle. And it was by a diplomat named Arthur Bliss Lane. And this was a very popular book among anti-communist activists uh, in the 50s. And, and after it went out of print from its original publications, it uh, continued in a variety of, of uh, editions under the John Birch Society, which uh, wanted to make sure and keep this book in print. And I wonder if, if maybe they still are keeping it in print uh, over there at um, uh, the New American Press, uh, or, or I think they call themselves American Opinion Press. So uh, you, I would run into people back in the 90s among conservatives who, who would still talk about this book and talk about how, oh, if only Roosevelt hadn't, hadn't handed over Eastern Europe to the Soviets. It's just, it wasn't that, that easy. Now, believe me, I don't think it troubled Roosevelt at all <laughs> that his buddy Stalin, Uncle Joe, got to dominate this region. I, I don't think Roosevelt cared at all. I think he probably thought that was fine. Uh, Roosevelt clearly was sympathetic to the, to the Soviets. Um, but at the same time, he, he didn't have to affirmatively say, I'm giving you Eastern Europe. All he had to do was be unwilling to essentially start World War III, this time between the U.S. and the Soviets in Eastern Europe, because in their thinking, they had expended all of the blood uh, to free Eastern Europe from... Uh, from German domination, and so they absolutely deserved then to be the the dominant hegemon in that region. They probably, maybe even, could have gotten away with annexing um, countries like Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, Romania. Who knows? Uh, they, uh, of course, in order for ideological reasons, they had to maintain the fiction that they cared about local democracy and that sort of thing. So they didn't annex those places, but certainly they. They made those countries into a buffer between the, the Russian East and the, um, the NATO West, and that served their purposes. But when you just look at the war, you just have to recognize that 
the bloodshed was on the Eastern Front. Uh, I mean, that's where just the worst, most horrible stuff was going on for both civilians and for soldiers. And in the in the what they call the Great Patriotic War, they weren't about to give up those gains and then just move out and God forbid let NATO troops move in there or maybe let uh, the Brits and the Americans divide up Romania or something like that. That was, they were not going to let that happen. They were just going to keep fighting. And of course, Stalin didn't have to stand for election. So he could have just kept things going and that would have been a lot of bloodshed for the Americans. So I, I think we do need to move beyond this idea that it was just, um, it was just too much laziness on the part of the Americans that they weren't willing to do that because that just wasn't the reality. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think, I mean, it's natural for people of whatever country to think that their role in World War II was so great and important. And it's natural. We emphasize things like D Day and North Africa and everything else. But, uh, I mean, it's just the, uh, as you pointed out, you know, we weren't facing the most experienced battle-hardened troops on the Western Front. The Ardennes offensive, like they just cleared out the German jails, you know, and uh, it, 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 I think it, people lose a lot of perspective. And I link to, uh, when, I, when I say something about uh, the brutal uh, genocidal war on the Eastern Front, uh, one of the I link to this New York Times review of that uh, book Bloodlands, which I haven't read yet, but uh, was immensely popular. Basically, documenting how it was just hell on earth on the Eastern Front, uh, and then uh, I link to this video that is just sort of a, one of those graphic graphics like videos demonstrating like the casualties that each country had in in the war, <laughs> and the, when they get to. Germany on the Eastern Front and the Soviet Union and like each each little body is a thousand people or something. It just is <laughs> it's it, it just it keeps going up, 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 and you can barely see all the other countries. Uh, it's uh, it's just it's it's really uh, we as Americans who have not been invaded since 1812 really and have you know not really had a catastrophic war where a huge percentage of our population has been killed i don't think we can really even fathom it and to your point about soviet concerns about nato and everything if your you know country just had this you know genocidal invasion where they're just slaughtering everyone in their path basically uh you're going to be pretty paranoid and worried about uh, being invaded again and letting that happen again. So it their logic, it, it drives me nuts when they're like, oh, they're imperialist, uh, as if, uh, you know, which they say back then and they say now about Putin as if it's just some sort of uh, desire for land for the sake of land. There's a motivation for basically a buffer zone. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's uh, what played a role in the post-World War II sort of... Uh, establishing the Warsaw Pact by force, and it's what I argue, uh, you know, along with, you know, John Mearsheimer's been arguing for over 10 years, uh, plays a role in the Ukraine conflict. Is uh, It's not tolerable to <laughs> let a openly hostile alliance park its tanks on the highway into your country, basically. The, inv the historical invasion highway, so... Well, and I think a big driver of that perspective is that it allows you, it allows Americans, right, who, who buy this kind of late betrayal narrative, it allows for a, a defense of World War II and everything leading up to it as, oh, that's the good side of history. And then Roosevelt surrenders everything at Yalta, and therefore that's where the turn is, and then obviously that feeds into Cold War narratives, where if we want to look at, you know, where were the, the, where the true betrayal began, right, it, it was American subsidization of the Soviet Union prior to our military involvement there. It was, it was the act of subsidization, it was Lend-Lease, it was all these, these economic tools that FDR used, again, because of sympathies both of himself and broader, very important uh, members of his administration to the larger Soviet project. And it was, you know, it was everything that kind of happened between that period of World War I and America's involvement in World War II that you know, if you're looking for you know, where, where, where did America play the role of sowing seeds of making this conflict as big and, and dangerous and, and, and horrific as it was, 
And, and of course, those are precisely the sort of policies that are baked in now into America's go-to playbook of, oh, okay, we're not, we're not sending troops here. We're not, we're not playing an active, war or active role in terms of the military side of things. We'll just, you know, we'll just subsidize an entire government, an entire state, an entire regime with both military and non-military supports uh, as, uh, aspects of it. Uh, uh, Sean McMeekin's book, uh, Stalin's Wars, is, is, a, is a great sort of uh, uh, look at just in the, the extent to which American taxpayers were act actively subsidizing uh, the Soviet Union uh, during that period. And of course, that's precisely the sort of, you know, it's, it's the kind of gentler, it's the, the less obvious, it's the stuff that doesn't take over uh, uh, media coverage and the like that America has preferred to use to kind of project its power um, you know, after after World War II, for the most part, with a few incidents here and there, uh, not not uh, you know, beyond that, and and so you know that it allows for a way of kind of taking taking away the the most noble aspects that Americans love to hang them hang their hats on with the World War II aspect of it, and then still be able to have a little bit of distance afterwards, leading up into the Cold War dynamic. And and I touch on it a little bit, but. It, it's it's to me World War II was not really a resounding success from a strategic point of view. What the the authors I'm responding to seem to think that the point of World War II was to liberate Poland, which is <laughs> not true. Uh, you know, it was to prevent a regional hegemon. It was to stop Germany's second run at, 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 at reaching at becoming the regional hegemon of uh, Western Eurasia, and. It, from that perspective, uh, we there was succeeded at stopping Germany from becoming a hegemon, but in turn, now oh, look, the Soviet Union stretches from the Elbe to the Pacific. So I don't think I mean even people who I think are very sound on today's foreign policy issues advance this case for World War II that I do not think really stands up. Um, well, I mean, you look at that a little bit in your article, right, where, where the authors say, well, the, the West should help Ukraine now as a way of atoning for its sins oh. Oh of not being yeah. pro-Poland enough after the Second World War. So many things wrong with, of course, that statement. As you point out, right, we don't have anything to atone for. And also, let's just assume that, okay, there were no good guys in the war, right? Now, more... Here at the Mises Institute, right, this is this is often what we encounter from people who criticize us is people are very bad at moving beyond just this desperate need to feel that there was a good guy in a variety of these conflicts, right? World War One, there wasn't a good guy. And stop pretending that there was a good guy and that there was some sort of righteous position on that. That one's easy to, to explain. World War II, who was the good guy here? Well, uh, I'm not saying that the U.S. regime was functioning on the same moral level as the Soviet regime. I'm not saying it's the same. But I am saying is that maybe there wasn't a good guy. Maybe you just had to pick one side that you thought maybe would do less horrible things by winning. And the West clearly chose their good guy. Their good guy was to ally with the Soviets against the Germans. Now, from the Polish point of view, uh, whining about uh, the West not helping them enough during World War II strikes me as just really stupid, and I don't want to hear it. Uh, first of all, had the Germans won, Poland wouldn't exist. I mean, this is, there would be no, the, there would be no Polish people. It was explicit Nazi policy to exterminate the Poles, to destroy the Polish nation. And the Soviets, for all the horrible things they did to the Poles, that was never their policy. And uh, they were willing to tolerate the Polish nation, fine, as long as they were good commies. Uh, but the, the, you could not could, you could not become a Nazi pole and avoid extermination. You didn't have that option. There was it, this was explicit in Nazi law that there was no legal status for poles of any kind. This, by the way, is why Ukrainians were able to become Nazis, but poles were not. They were legally barred from becoming Nazis because it was felt that poles couldn't be Nazis. They just couldn't be anything other than dead. So this idea then that the West, to uh, oh, you just weren't good enough to us Poles, uh, be quiet, right? <laughs> like, uh, look, we got, we got rid of the Nazis, and uh, the, that's, that's excellent for Poland. And as I wrote in a recent article, I had to write an article because I started getting submissions from people saying, well, Churchill was awful, so I guess the Nazis weren't that bad. And so I had to like list the many reasons why the Nazis were bad, one of <laughs> which was they wanted to exterminate the Poles. And... 
uh, often the people who are now saying that the Nazis aren't that bad are people who fancy themselves like great defenders of Western civilization, like great Western traditionalists. I'm like, look, if your position is defending Western civilization and Christendom, exterminating the Poles is exactly the last thing you should be doing. And I can think of three times where the Poles saved Christian Europe's ass uh, <laughs> from, right, Muslims, from the Soviets in 1920. I mean, lots of cases of this. Uh, so, yeah, don't come back. Don't, don't at me, bro, about how I, I hate Poles or something. No, I think... Poles as the eastern frontier of Christendom have done immense good, and I'm glad they weren't murdered by the Nazis. Uh, at the same time, though, not my job as a modern-day American to atone for whatever it is my great-grandparents did wrong uh, in World War II. So the whole premise is dumb. But let's move on to the, to the issue of spheres of influence, because this is at the heart of what you just said. Zachary, in terms of like, okay, so they essentially got rid of the Germans as a hegemon, erasing the German sphere of influence in Central Europe, allowing the Soviets to move in and establish a much further west sphere of influence. Now, today, we continue to hear from critics of Russia and critics of our laissez-faire, relatively peaceful position that... Well, you just, you're just you pro-Russian because you want to allow the Russians to have a sphere of influence. Well, first of all, our position isn't that we want to give a sphere of influence to Russia. We just recognize that all regional hegemons have a sphere of influence. This is just a reality. And, the, and anyone who denies that the Americans have a sphere of influence just are being unserious. I wrote an article <laughs> on this back in 2022, right? Americans have a huge sphere of influence. It's called the Western Hemisphere. And as you point out in your article, Zach, right, it's called the Monroe Doctrine. That was the United States establishing a sphere of influence. So now to come around and say, oh, Russians, they're stuck in the 18th century. They're still thinking in terms of sphere of influence. We Americans are far too advanced for that. Pure nonsense. Absolute uh, laughable garbage. Because the, uh, if, if Americans had no sphere of influence, as you and I have both said in various places, then we would have no problem with the Venezuelans or the Chinese or the Russians having a few military bases in Russia right on the American border. It'd be like, well, we can't tell neighboring countries, right? I mean, we don't have a sphere of influence. That would be the reality. And so obviously, uh, nobody takes that idea seriously. Uh, so, yeah, forget about this idea that... Uh, um, we can't take Russian paranoia or Russian ideas about how it needs buffers and how it needs a sphere of influence until Americans get rid of their own sphere of influence. Yeah, as, as Mearsheimer is fond of saying in relation to this, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I mean, yeah, we're, we're the only regional hegemon on the planet currently. <laughs> so, And in a way, it's, uh, I mean... Talk about paranoia. Uh, sometime in the early 2000s, or, or maybe it was the 90s, I'm confusing now, the, basically a document was put out where uh, the government's policy was not only do we have to maintain our regional hegemony in the Western Hemisphere, but we have to proactively crush any potential regional, regional hegemon anywhere else. Uh, so that's why we're so concerned uh, about uh, Russia and China, because as the only other two great powers, they're the only people who could potentially become a hegemon. But really, I mean, uh, I take the sort of uh, very, very, for me, the only threat to the U.S. that could come from, you know, I mean, uh, our greatest dangers to ourselves, I'd say. The only external threat that, you know, unless there's some crazy technological shift, is a true Eurasian hegemon, which has never existed. And uh, is quite, is, is hard to imagine existing because the only other two great powers are Russia and China. And they're working together now, but this is an aberration in history. Just a few decades ago, they were shooting at each other uh, along the Amor River. Uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, it, it just, uh, this, this is how international politics works. And to draw the connection then from, oh, Poland was betrayed, we're already seeing the groundwork for this myth or whatever you want to call it being laid today for Ukraine. And uh, this guy, uh, so RUSI, the Royal United Service Institute, has some good reports, but they're very 
hawkish. Um, and they, they had this new article, The Impending Betrayal of Ukraine, which I did not bother to read. But Justin Logan had a, a rather funny tweet about it because this guy, John Cipher, who I think used to be with the CIA, he said, uh, quoting it, the West will have years to repent the betrayal of the courageous Ukrainians whose only crime was their wish to join the Western democratic order. And uh, uh, Justin Logan says, uh, whose only crime? And he says, seriously, this is international politics, not Wuthering Heights. <laughs> uh, I mean, the it... Uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, uh, he wrote um, the present age. Robert Nisbet uh, in the present age, which is a, a very short book. Highly recommend it. He, he he looks at what would the founding fathers. Uh, it, it was like the two hundredth anniversary of the signing of the Constitution, I think. And he, he he gave a talk that then became this book of how, what would the founding fathers look at today you know, and be shocked about, aside from technological changes. And the, the whole premise basically is America's militarism that has grown up that's so <laughs> out of whack with sort of the founding ethos. And he has this great line that uh, something along the lines of America's uh, foreign policy is just uh, uh, dominated by moralism these days, which is, it's... Uh, this is a conversation for another time. I disagree with John Mearsheimer when he says that foreign policy is amoral. Uh, I think foreign policy can be conducted morally. But that does not mean that it's, uh, this is Sunday school or something here. This is, this is uh, sort of the, the, the logic of kindergartners. And it's disturbing that so many people who are either are or close to decision makers have this, this fairy tale view of uh, of how the world works well of course the fairy tale aspect of it is that you know if if poland for example i um, mean and we see this play out in real time right with, with hungary right if 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 one of these countries that we're told is such a romantic thing and we you know we've got to you know, we've got to we've got to project our sphere of influence so that we can protect the sovereignty and the democratic institutions and the self-governing nature of these of these eastern european countries the second that these countries start pushing back and reject certain aspects that we take as being necessary for living a, a moral life, a, a moral political body, then they become, they, they, they get attacked by all their nominal allies. Again, uh, Hungary uh, with Orban is, is one of the, the better examples of it. We see it with the way that, again, you've got, uh, um, you know, you've got, you got Georgia right now that has pushed legislation that the West doesn't like. And obviously there's a kind of unique sort of uh, history there within the caucuses writ large is, is, is very interesting. I don't want to try to confuse it with, with Eastern Europe per se, um, but, but you know, not now they're being attacked for, you know, passing, um, you know, the, because their social, you know, their, their social values, their cultural values being codified into law do not uh, reflect well upon Western values. Again, the, the, the entire notion that ultimately what America's sphere of influence truly desires is some sort of democratic norm of political self-determination is itself a lie on its face. And you see this, again, the second that any of these other global leaders, any of these other world leaders start stepping out of line with what we desire for them, then all of a sudden our concerns about their dem democratic institutions goes out the window as much as it does at ours. Yes, uh, Hungary, great evil, Saudi Arabia lopping people's heads off left and right. <laughs> our great ally that we're, con well, well, yeah, the supposed ally, that drives me nuts. Uh, we have very few actual treaty allies, but now they're considering making Saudi Arabia one. And it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Yes, as long as the U.S. and the Saudi regime are on good terms, we, we just can't take anything seriously. I mean, yeah, come on. It's, it's, uh, but uh, on, uh, on a... Um, uh, well, I mean... Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, th this provides a lot of historical context. But what does this mean for us today in terms of, okay, so the U.S. doesn't owe Eastern Europe anything. I... I think we can we can establish that with what we're saying here. Uh, we're not, we don't have to atone for past sins, whatever they were. Uh, but geopolitical reparations, right? <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> right. Oh, we need to, good, you yeah. know, screw all those people <laughs> dying in the mud in uh, North Carolina. What really matters is atoning for our sins we committed against the Ukrainians. We, by which I mean people, Americans who are all dead now, assuming they even committed these sins. So. 
what does the U.S. owe Ukraine now? What what are these polls arguing? How does this? Well, I mean, I, you you say so in the article, but explain to us, Zach, how Americans who pay all these taxes that are being hauled hauled over to the Ukrainians, given to the Ukrainians. How does this benefit the Americans in any way? So do the Americans benefit from atoning for these sins and uh, bailing out the Ukrainians? And uh, I don't see a moral obligation to the Ukrainians, so uh, why why is it we should be in, involved with this? And I know what they're going to say is that, well, if the U.S. doesn't um, fight back in Ukraine, the Soviets will be rolling tanks into Berlin and Vienna and maybe Paris any day after that, you know, the, the day after uh, uh, we capitulate on Ukraine. So explain to us what the reality is of the U.S. not getting involved in Ukraine. Goodness, yes. I mean, to the U.S., it makes uh, to our security, it makes no difference who controls Ukraine, whether Ukraine is an independent state, whether Russia annexes the whole country, which will not happen, or whether Russia annexes half the country uh, or establishes a puppet state, not, none of this will affect us at all. And it, you touch on this, this very strange contradiction that so many people have, where it's, uh, on the one hand, Russia is such a weak, failed state. Their soldiers are starving and fighting with with shovels in these uh, human wave assaults. Uh, they're ki they're stealing uh, washing machines because they're so poor they don't have them. And uh, yet, at the same time, if, uh, 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 well, one, what's that say about Ukraine? Because Russia keeps graining territory. But at the same time, we're told if if NATO doesn't literally actively join the war, although they they use euphemisms like institute a no-fly zone or, or start shooting down Russian missiles from uh, NATO country-based air defense systems, uh, that, that Russia's going to steamroll right through. And uh, if it, 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 the, it's obvious that Europe as a whole doesn't take this seriously. Poland has increased its military spending some. Everyone else has not. <laughs> uh, Germany uh, and the UK especially are jokes. They're, they're, I mean, before the war started, the head of the German military said, you know, basically Germany could not contribute anything to a NATO operation. Right when the war started, the head of the UK land forces said it would be at least 2030 until the UK could deploy an armored division to continental Europe. If we were, if Russia was truly the threat that uh, all these nutty people are saying, uh, there would be mass conscription, there would be, you know, software companies would be <laughs> shutting down uh, and we'd be opening tank and armament factories. I mean, it would be uh, nothing but intense military buildup. Yet, I mean, all these European countries have literally shipped away basically their whole arsenals. At one point last year, Germany had 30,000 or maybe it was 20,000 high explosive <laughs> artillery shells in the whole country, which is less than a day of what Russia, uh, what, less, less than what Russia fires in a single day. Uh, so these, these countries, their militaries are a joke, yet it's not a national crisis for them. So, you know, talk is cheap. What's their demonstrated preference? Uh, so uh, Ukraine does not matter to the security of the United States and the arguments put forward that it does, this very strange and completely ridiculous domino theory makes no sense. Uh, so we should obviously leave NATO, <laughs> uh, but uh, which is being talked about more and more, still a minority view, but uh, hopefully that will become less of a fringe position in the years to come. Well, and I should know it again, right? I don't care if NATO exists. There's just no reason for the United States to be part of it. And we're talking about countries that are far more wealthy than the Russians. Uh, the Germans, if they wanted, could create a nuclear arsenal within a few weeks. They, uh, of course, their per capita GDP is far, far above that of the Russians. And in one of my essays talking about real military power, right, it's not enough to just look at overall GDP. That actually tells you very little. 
uh, about a country's uh, overall military prowess. It's their per capita GDP is a major is at least as important as overall GDP because that tells you what sort of surplus a country has in terms of creating armaments. So the Germans have, without reducing their population to a state of poverty, huge surpluses in terms of resources they could steal essentially from their population and create a huge military buildup. The Russians are already arguably near capacity maybe in terms of what it is that they can mobilize and take from their population without reducing their population to a state of declining per capita GDP and wealth. And and one of the few European countries that has a lower GDP uh, per capita than Russia is Ukraine. Which, by the way, illustrates how stupid it is, this idea that Russians are stealing washing machines from Ukrainians. It's Ukrainians who need washing machines much more than the Russians, because they're a much poorer country. Uh, and so you look at the French, you look at the Germans, you look at, just look at some of these other medium-sized, heck, the Italians, the Spaniards, right? They were, if they were to put together their resources, uh, their military would be many, many times more technologically advanced, well-stocked, and just larger than anything the Russians could put together. They don't need the Americans involved. So uh, America leaving NATO really has absolutely nothing to do with the security of Europe. It has to do with the ability of the United States to insinuate itself into European politics. Uh, and to fight its its many imagined um, ideological wars with the Russians and such, but it just it, it's not relevant to actual defense. And I guess the Russians understand this based on the things you just pointed out in terms of the lack of any German mobilization whatsoever uh, on this issue. Uh, but maybe we should just uh, go to the part where we have where we uh, where we do predictions for what's going to happen. <laughs> in the near, near future. So I'll start. I think maybe there's, I, I like to just pretend the, the option of World War III isn't really on the table. Um, there is a distinct possibility that the US could really become involved in that and up things. And we find ourselves in like a real true war for the first time since 1945 over Ukraine, which is just insane. Uh, but my prediction is, is that I think uh, the Middle East will continue to uh, occupy more and more of the thinking of Washington and that Ukraine will become kind of this uh, this side issue. And as the, the Russians move further and further west, which they're clearly doing and accelerating their gains as well, intervention in Ukraine will become less and less attractive for the west and there'll be less and less good news to report out of that. So I, I predict just a pivot back toward the Middle East. We keep talking about pivoting somewhere else, like to Asia or whatever. That just never seems to happen. It's just the Middle East. It's the state of Israel every year, every week. And I think the focus is going to go more toward that, even if Kamala wins. If Trump wins, then I think for sure, definitely a pivot away from Ukraine and with a, a obsessive even focus maybe on the Middle East at that point. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> as many listeners probably already know, the U.S. is deploying troops to Israel, about 100 troops to man a THAAD system, Terminal High Altitude Aerial Defense, I think. Uh, which, of course, has the Ukrainians fuming because, I mean, at the beginning of last year when there was those Discord document leaks uh, from the, like, 18-year-old in the National Guard, uh, it was like, oh, my goodness, Ukraine's going to run out of air defenses in a few weeks. That was at the beginning of last year. So, I mean, they, they it's, it's, it's very clear, I think, that... It, many, many more Russian missiles and assaults are getting through, and they're always begging for more air defenses. And they're like, you're giving Israel whatever the heck they want, <laughs> including a THAAD system, and you won't give that to us. And one, it's because we can't give everything to Israel and everything to Ukraine. And, uh, but, I mean, I, I can't really, I, I have no idea what an actual argument would be for Israel's strategic necessity for American security is either other than that they have a better, more well-organized domestic lobby here in the U.S. than the Ukrainians do. Um, yeah, the, I think we're going to continue to be stuck there. I. It's hard to see whichever candidate wins anyone playing hardball and putting their foot down to Israel, who's just doing whatever the heck they want uh, without consulting us uh, or consulting us and then just 
ignoring everything we talked about. Uh, and at the same time, it's hard to imagine Israel being able to continue doing what it's doing without American support. So the, uh, domestically, pulling the rug out from under you, uh, Israel and saying, well, you can do whatever you want, but we're just not going to keep shoveling weapons to you, is hard to imagine being domestically viable. Um, I do think that, I mean, who knows, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, so Ukraine could continue holding on for a long time. I do think it's possible that the war might start to wind down um, in the coming months, but I, I wouldn't bet any money on that, but it's, it, I'm just putting out there it's possible. The, the Russian gains in the Donbass, which are made possible by Ukraine's very foolish incursion into Kursk Oblast, uh, the, the, I mean, Russia, it allowed Russia to make dramatic gains and they're closing in on uh, Poltavsk. I, I, I don't remember how to say it, but this crucial rail hub that uh, behind which there's not much. I mean, the Donbass is that area of Ukraine, which was originally part of Russia, that Khrushchev gave to Ukraine, Ukrainian Socialist Republic as a gift. And it's the area full of big cities and industry. Most of Ukraine, other than that, is just vast steppe with uh, no defenses and uh, or or tantalizing terrain and, and all that stuff. So uh, at the same time, though, Zelensky is still talking delusional things about joining NATO as the first step to the peace plan, which is not going to happen. I mean, anything can happen, but I, I think Putin would have to be, you know, on meth or something to accept a deal like that. So uh, who knows, but there's not much stuff for us to send Ukraine anymore. They're running out of men, they're running out of weapons. It's very sad, but that's, that's how international politics is and always will be. And uh, Poland and Ukraine are unfortunate cases because they're in basically, you know, the worst geopolitical positions possible. And uh, that's why they have a history of being invaded and conquered. And it's not our job as Americans to stop that from happening, uh, no matter how tragic and unfortunate that reality is. Well, I think American domestic politics is going to definitely have an impact on the timeline of the Ukraine situation. Now, I, and, and I think if you play it out, right, if the Middle East is going to be a mess no matter what, again, I'm, I'm very interested to see. I, th I think Israeli domestic politics is going to end up having a bigger impact than anything that happens in America there in terms of the trajectory of everything going on um, in the Middle East. Um, I, I do think, though, that if, if, um, if Kamala wins, I think that prolongs American involvement with Ukraine. And I think that might hasten uh, combat in, in the, the Eastern Pacific. Like, I, I could see China... You know, for example, being more aggressive in a, a, a four, four more years of Kamala with the distractions elsewhere, whereas I think there could be a, a bit of a, a resetting of that dynamic. I, ironically, with Trump being kind of the political force that kind of changed you know, Chinese-American relations in the first place, I think that the, the best likelihood of prolonging any sort of aggression from China comes from a, a Trump victory there, kind of tidying up our uh, connectedness in the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict and perhaps even resetting some diplomatic relations there. So I, I think that's, that would that, be my expectation going in. Of course, we won't be able to see the counterfactual based off what happens here, but uh, that's, that's kind of the way that I, I view things right now. But I, I, want, I want, before we end, I want to give the readers some, uh, uh, to end on a happy note. So as, as, as followers of the Mises Twitter account might have seen, uh, there, there's a new Hearts of Iron 4 expansion uh, that will allow you to pursue an alternative history route of reestablishing the uh, Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And one of your choices for finance minister is Ludwig von Mises. So yes, the past, very sad, very depressing, evil Wilson, you know, in short, Austria-Hungary was broken up, which might have helped potentially avoid the World War II situation. But in Hearts of Iron IV, you can right all these wrongs, appoint Mises as the <laughs> Minister of Finance, and, you know, make everything happy and good, and, uh, you know, institute Austrian economics, turn Austria-Hungary into a great, you know, libertarian 
uh, you know, classical liberal utopia. In a few, few years, we might be in the pods eating the bugs, but at least we can be re recreating the, a better world from indeed, the comfort of indeed, our, of our yes. lives. <laughs> to put on the goggles, plug yourself in permanently <laughs> to the, the version of history where Mises wins politically. Uh, all right, well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this uh, episode of uh, Radio Rothbard. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week with more, so we'll see you next time.